Hello, everyone. I'm Jason Cohen, the author of an introduction to the art and science of Chinese tea ceremony. Today, we're discussing book one, chapter six, section four, Confucian life, Confucian mind. Here to talk about this chapter is our editorial team, Patrick Penny and Ryan Ah. Hello, Pat. Hello, Ryan. Hey, Jason. Hello. My first question. What is your conception of the tenets of classical Confucianism? Pass. Hard pass. <laughs> I have nothing to add. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> what do you make of the Buddhist Eightfold Path and how has it affected your life? I figured that we weren't really going to have much of a conversation about that one. Did you actually write that down? <laughs> just, just to see what would happen. Live, live your life well. <laughs> Respect your elders. Do unto others as they be done unto you. <laughs> Respect the hierarchy. The clergy is corrupt. You can have a personal relationship with God. <laughs> That's Martin Luther. Okay. Why did the Kajio, the imperial examination, have such a profound impact on the shared experiences of the scholar officials? So the uh, Kujiu was a, you know, institutionalized test uh, and Confucianism holds that civil institutions, right, are an important part of a functioning society. Uh, the well-being of a society is dictated by these institutions. Uh, and so these uh, scholars, officials, right, to be uh, government appointees um, are all studying the same materials. Uh, so the test that they're going to take is all going to be based on the same, uh, you know, classics, depending on the time. Um, so if this is being, you know, done in the Tang dynasty, uh, at this point, you know, there are some philosophical texts such as, uh, you know, original texts of, of Confucianism, uh, as well as many other, uh, forms of thought, right? Like legalism, uh, you know, the writing of Mengxi, uh, Taoism, Buddhism. So there's going to be a lot of, uh, text to draw upon, but what the focus of the test is going to be is going to be the same for everybody. And so they're all going to be studying the same materials, uh, and thus they're going to go through the shared experience where their, you know, their frame of thought is being structured by uh, the, uh, I would say, the outline of the material that's going to be on the test. They're all studying for this test and they're all going to know the same roughly knowledge. Uh, so through taking that test and shaping their knowledge in the same way, uh, they're going to have the shared experience. Not so unsimilar to what we had uh, going through the Teen Institute of Penn State together, where we were studying for, you know, all an exam, uh, all kind of studying the same base knowledge, getting ready for the same test, uh, which, you know, would really led to being a formative experience where a lot of us formed a lot of bonds, and it really shaped the framework for how we'd approach our praxis going forward. I feel very we've... unqualified to talk about this topic. I mean, one thing I could add is that, you know, it's a reflection of their values and it, like there's this whole mini ecosystem that's formed around this test and it's the primary form of social mobility and that um, just like in any um, I don't know if microculture is the right word to use right there's um, a lot of internal dynamics that happen um, where you know you, you step in or you're formed by um, by that microculture, which will inform your preferences. It's not unlike, you know, uh, what, what we do today still, right? We go through standardized testing in high school. Uh, you know, if we so choose to go on to college, we'll still face standardized tests of some sort, uh, which will shape, you know, uh, not only what we learn, but uh, as well, you know, what career choice we take. And then depending on what career you're entering, right, what field you're entering, you might have tests to qualify there as well. Uh, and so it's it's providing a certain level uh, of individual with a certain level of talent to be able to take on this role. Um, but it also certainly shapes the, the thoughts and processes uh, that that individual uh, goes through when they try and do this. Like, let's say it's teaching, right? You, you go through praxis tests uh, and you're taught like pedagogy, right? Uh, depending on what uh, age range you want to teach. Uh, and you and everyone else who's going to be teaching that age range have roughly gone through the same training and had the same framework on how to do that, that teaching. So it's, it's, even though it's a, you know, different time, a different culture, it's not so unlike what we do today. Uh, just obviously it covers a very different range of topics.
And the incentives are really powerful, right? If it's the primary form of social mobility, you know, it's um, that it really shifts the incentives um, in certain directions around those values that the in terms of what's being tested. And if you look at two other like really micro examples nowadays, you know, if you compare um, coffee uh, versus wine, the structure for wine, as well as the incentives for learning a lot about wine um, are, you know, really strong. There's a lot of structure and there's a lot of incentive to learn about it because there are a lot of lucrative jobs and positions. Um, whereas in coffee, you know, there's some on the supply chain side, but at a consumer connoisseurship level, it's just not really there. You know, there's specialty coffee and there's a lot of people who talk about it, but in terms of an, you know, a, a great structure in the same way that we see for wine, it just is, it, it doesn't exist because there's no incentive for someone to go through those paths. And then we have tea at the very bottom rung uh, where there's, there's absolutely no incentive to take a lot of these trainings on as far as uh, career mobility uh, goes. You know, obviously personal learning is a different thing, but um, just as with, you know, people going to college to hopefully get a better job. Uh, I think, you know, as you said, Ryan, lots of people go through small A training because it, it can provide uh, a job and a career for them. I don't think we're seeing that yet with tea. I think coffee will definitely be the next one to get there. Yeah. Maybe with the exception of Chanoyu, where there is such a structure in place. This is similar to our conversation that we had in top-down schools tests and competitions. And that leads us very nicely into my next question, which was actually going to be, well, are there any other historical tests uh, or contemporary tests that ri rivaled the could you in impact? But I will now preface that because we've already entered that conversation uh, with the idea that in China, they still have uh, the national exam uh, to get into university. It's a, a difficult exam that everyone studies for. It has a very, uh, it has a very convergent effect uh, on the students who sit for it. Japan has it, the national university exam. But why do we see so few examples of that type of national examination, that type of, um, heavy preparation and study for a singular deciding factor uh, in the Western world? Well, I think we have better systems in place now. And also the skill sets needed are more specialized. Um, having those skill sets, you know, is great. And it's a great unifying factor and probably selects for some very smart people. Um, but nowadays you have very diverse professions that require very different sets of knowledge and experience and ways of thinking. Uh, and different forms of creativity. Um, so, you know, while a unifying standard like that is, is great, and we still have them, SAT, ACT, we even have more specialized ones, like if you want to study law or medicine, um, where these there, there are these institutionalized exams, um, which act as a, a fairly good filter. Um, you know, it's, it's still only a filter. And you believe that those are a better system? I think we're moving away from them in general, I so um, I, I think some level of filter is necessary. You don't want your surgeon um, to to not you know know yeah you know, so chemistry and mathematics, um, but um, um, but as you know professions get more diverse and creativity becomes more important in work and knowledge work especially, um, those tests as gatekeepers. Um, become, I think the utility of them becomes less and less effective. And yet the United States education system is now making SATs optional and ACTs optional. They're reducing our dependency on standardized tests. So are they useful? And is this a cultural difference between the Western world and the Eastern world? So I, you know, I, I taught in Japan for two years. The focus on these tests is definitely uh, night and day when we look at East versus West. Um, these students, you know, in uh, Japan, at least I can say, uh, and I'm sure the same uh, goes for China and Taiwan, um, they treat this test like it's their life uh, because uh, by large in part, it, it will determine uh, how they move through society, at least for the next 10 to 15 years after they graduate. It will really impact the way they're able to, to move through companies, uh, through government, if that's what they want, et cetera. Um, and, you know, the same just isn't true in the U.S. You can get into a great school, uh, do really well, and that's, of course, going to give you more options. Um, 
but it doesn't, I wouldn't say it's make or break and we don't treat it like it's make or break uh, to the same kind of point that Ryan was touching upon where I think we just have less of a focus and we put less importance on standardized testing and we're continuing to move in that direction, moving away from standardized testing. Uh, just as you said, right, Jason, we're, we're thinking about some of these tests being optional. Um, we still do have statewide testing, right, that goes on uh, at a at public level. Um, so, you know, kids are still being tested to make sure they're learning what they need to learn, right? Uh, it's it's important we all know. What's that? Depends on the state. Depends on the state, uh, you know, but uh, I think Ryan and I, right, Ryan, I think you're in public school. So we, we both took uh, Pennsylvania State, uh, you know, exams, the PSATs. Um, and, you know, it just, it's to make sure we're, we're learning, uh, what, what kids should know at that age. But, um, I, I would say in general, um, testing of that sort really only shows that you are very good at rote memorization. Uh, you're good at studying for an exam. It shows that you have the skills to memorize things and have the input, remember it and have the output. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily speak to your aptitude in, you know, all facets of life or in uh, your ability to perform in a career. Uh, and I think, you know, research is starting to show that without having uh, any to cite right now. Uh, but, uh, you know, this, this is a different time. Certainly we're living in than the Tang Dynasty, uh, the Song or the Ming. And, you know, this, this type of examination, I think, has had its usefulness in shaping culture and society and incubating the kind of culture that has led to our uh, praxis, right? Um, but might not necessarily be what is necessary moving forward uh, if we want to think about how do we shape our praxis going forward. Uh, an exam like the could you might not be it. How has testing in other praxis around food and beverage, particularly something like the quartermaster sommelier exam, where individuals gather in groups and study together, how has that created a shared sense of culture or microculture or an ideal culture that allows individuals to uh, enter a group, gain knowledge, gain uh, the, the types of formative experiences that are necessary that could not be gained without them. Um, why is it that it exists in wine and it does not exist in tea? I think it's, it's an all has to do with incentives. So there's a whole institution based around a shared set of incentives where you ascend the ladder and we, we something- talk, We talked about this. Uh, incentives and schools tests and competitions, but this question is actually a little bit different. This goes back to the question about culture, right? We just said that the Asian world is more interested in uh, this type of standardized testing. The Kuju has been a historical part of China um, for hundreds of years. And yet when we look for a test uh, related food and beverage, related to tasting ability, related to uh, a praxis, actually the one that we find that is most established is wine, which comes out of the Western world. Um, why is that? Where does this cultural discrepancy come from? It, it is interesting uh, because, you know, we're looking at tea and tea ceremony, right? This is something that comes from uh, China, right? So a praxis that was incubated in the same culture uh, where the kuju was taking place. And yet for tea, at least uh, outside of China, right, there is no uh, national testing uh, to achieve a, a job outside of maybe what Ryan was talking about, right? China has a structure. Um, but for Gong Fu Cha, right, there's, there's no structure uh, that is agreed upon, uh, you know, that has formed where, where we're seeing the same thing that happens in uh, the wine world. Um, there, there is a testing structure within China, right, to be a, you know, tea specialist, and that is a government certified job. Um, but outside within the world of tea ceremony, we don't have it. And so I think that's an interesting to think about because, um, this Western culture that incubated, uh, wine, uh, and interest in wine and eventually led to us having some kind of infrastructure for, uh, you know, testing within it, um, is coming from the West is coming from a culture that's less obsessed with, uh, testing or standardization. Uh, and yet we still have uh, a very strong framework that has formed. And within that, we have all of these idiocultures and microcultures where people are getting together to uh, pass this test together, sharing knowledge, pushing each other's boundaries, right, to, to eventually progress their knowledge system to the point where they can, right, achieve this distinction, pass this test. Uh, so it is kind of strange to think about that, you know, we're taking a practice that came from the same culture where the Kuju was formed 
uh, and that does not have a strict or rigorous testing system, uh, you know, as it applies to globally uh, Kung Fu Chao. I mean, I still think it goes back to incentives. You know, even in China, there was, you know, in, in, in terms of tests, it, the test wasn't necessarily on tea, right? Tea and the practice of tea was almost a byproduct of that microculture that was formed uh, around the literati tradition um, as a pastime, as something to, to, um, to enjoy. Um, and, you know, it, in wine, there's always been this commercial aspect where you could build a brand like the, quarter of ma- ma- the court of master sommeliers um, and you could build a profession around that brand having that certification and it has utility. I mean, I think it all goes back to incentives. I do think there's something special about, uh, you know, the idiocultures that are formed uh, during, you know, these these testing uh, phases, though, just like I had mentioned in the beginning of this uh, recording, um, you know, the the bonds that we formed while we were all studying for uh, the T of Penn State's T specialist exam, right, uh, are something that I don't think can, can be replaced. But also at that time, right, the uh, speed at which we accelerated our learning, um, the speed at which we tested our uh, hypotheses, theses about different brewing technique, um, you know, I, I think just the uh, rate at which the knowledge that surrounded us on tea history, ceremony, culture uh, became part of our working body of knowledge uh, just far outpaces anything that we could have done on our own. Um, and so those those idiocultures and microcultures are really powerful. Um, and, I'm, you know, I think we, we've discussed many times before, how do we recreate that? Uh, virtually, how do we create that without some kind of centralized institution? Uh, and it's tough, but I, I think that's really where a lot of, you know, the highest level of learning happens when you have these practitioners coming together to discuss, you know, taste together, uh, talk theory. I mean, it just, you can't speed it up any faster than what you're learning when you're with, you know, other high level practitioners. I note in this chapter that the proportion of scholar officials from elite families remained stable, even as more individuals took the imperial examination. And those scholar officials were appointed from their individual scores. And so I propose a thought exercise. Were they the same sons that would have been appointed without the imperial examination? Yeah, I think something you, you point out in the chapter as well, right, is that um, the sons of right wealthy families, the sons of the elite, uh, are certainly going to have more time on their hands, right, to um, to study, to, you know, uh, learn the arts, uh, the, you know, theory, history, philosophy, culture necessary uh, to, to score well on the exam. Um, and so I think that while, you know, the exam might have been opened up to a wider range of people, um, a lot of the people, aside from the elites, the, the sons of elites, right, uh, just didn't have the same opportunity or time uh, or you know, time resources, et cetera, uh, to score as well as the, the sons of the elites did. So I think by large in part, uh, you know, if we were going to put a number to it, something like probably 70 to 80 percent of the people who are sitting the exam and successfully passing it are probably the same people who would have, regardless of who was allowed to take the test. But yeah. are they the same sons? If they came from the wealthy families and multiple sons, multiple individuals from across the empire, all from these variations of wealthy families, were able to have the time to study. The pass rate was still only varied between two and five percent. So my question is, are they the same sons uh, who pass the test and are appointed than it would be without the test? But my contention is that it is probably not, that this is a weak meritocracy. Uh, because of uh, equality of uh, equality of choice, equality of availability, um, but it is meritocracy um, because of meritocracy of outcome. So people have different access to different levels of resources in which to prepare themselves. Um, but it is their preparation, it is their performance on the test that greatly controls whether or not they they are appointed. Oh, certainly. I mean, having the test in place. Um, you know, makes them earn it. Um, even though, you know, they, they command more resources because of the, um, the family they were born into. Um, but at the same time, it's not, you know, the divine right of the womb where you're, you're uh, you know, you're born in and by, by default, um, you are able to remain in that position. And what did that do to the underlying culture? 
having everyone, uh, whether from an elite family or not, taking the same tests and only promoting those tasks, what did that do to the underlying culture? Well, certainly made them work harder. I didn't want to use Ryan's word, but uh, it sounds like it's a, a pretty broad incentive, right? Uh, you don't have to be uh, born, you know, elite to rise up uh, to the highest level, right, of, of society. So um, it kind of does the same thing that I think uh, college, right, has has done to the U.S., where um, as long as you can get in, work hard, uh, is what you're told, right? Um, you, you can achieve uh, some, some degree of success, right? Uh, so that that's how I would assume people felt then is, okay, I'm not an elite, but if I work hard, um, I can still be an elite. What are the echoes of the tests still felt today, particularly in Chinese tea ceremony? I don't want to uh, cite exactly what you said uh, in the chapter, right? But um, as we kind of discussed earlier in the recording, uh, these tests are uh, convergent force, right? So everyone is is studying the same things. They're learning the same stuff. They're having similar output to pass this test. Uh, and so, you know, the highest echelon of culture, which is where a lot of the progression within tea ceremony is happening, uh, at the highest echelon of this culture, you have a lot of convergent thought. Uh, and so that's going to, uh, you know, splash out into the world of tea as these uh, individuals, you know, um, go and practice their hobby like calligraphy, reading scrolls, uh, practicing tea, um, having this similar convergent thought between all of the literati class is going to mean that a lot of the output within their hobbies uh, is probably going to look pretty similar. And I'm sure that that has affected the tea world. Jason, what, what was your intention behind the, uh, the title, Confucian Life, Confucian Mind? My intention was to draw attention to the fact that there was a, a state religion and that that state religion did evolve. Uh, it evolved both um, within itself um, and without itself. And what I mean by that is that as it became a state religion and as it was co-opted by the state and as society changed and, and adopted uh, other traditions and other belief systems and part of the syncretic tradition that I write about in later chapters, that it went from an orthodoxy, um, which is an actual religion, to an orthopraxy, which means that's something that, it, that uh, enforces actions. And those actions were really about the uh, propagation of the state and the propagation of the social structure of China, even as the social structure was changing. And so Confucianism, uh, far from being simply a, a state religion or far from being um, our ideals in the Western world about the role of religion, where you had the papacy and uh, the, the Catholic Church, and that created a separate power structure independent from uh, the state. Um, that's closer to the role that Buddhism had, with Buddhism having uh, the, the Songha, the monastic systems, and the monasteries um, separate from the state. But Confucianism was very much a, a state religion, and anyone who worked for the state had to be schooled in it. Um, and it created an idealized form of what uh, right mind and right action should be. And so it's necessary to draw attention to that because in the following chapters, we discuss the way that uh, classical Confucianism turns into Neo-Confucianism um, in the Song Dynasty. And then we discuss the individual actors in the Tang and the Song Dynasty that create uh, the Chinese tea praxis that we have today, particularly Lu Yu. Um, so that, that was my intention in a nutshell. Was there uh, meant to be any reference to uh, Sen Soshitsu the 15th's Tea Life, Tea Mind? Uh, it is a direct reference, Tea Life, Tea Mind. Um, the, the idea is that, you know, as, as, as I write, um, these things come from the originating culture, and the originating culture um, was originally Confucianist before it was Neo-Confucianist and the syncretic tradition, and everything that we practice comes out of that. I absolutely love it. Well, everyone, that's all the time that we have for today. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Tea Technique Editorial Conversations. Please join us again for a discussion of the next chapter, The Taste of Vinegar.